Great. And so just to summarize, overt HE encompasses stage two, three, and four, and then covert hepatic encephalopathy is the stage one, and also something called minimal hepatic encephalopathy. So Elliot, what is minimal hepatic encephalopathy and, and how might you pick that up? Yeah, so I think minimal encephalopathy is uh, the idea that if you provoke a patient through uh, some uh, fancy uh, uh, standardized formal neuropsychiatric tests, or if you put an EEG machine on them, you might see some changes in brainwave pattern that are manifest predominantly in deficits of executive function. They're not going to be great at math, essentially. essentially. Uh, and uh, you can put them through a battery of tests to define that, but that's predominantly the domain of research, and there's a lot of pitfalls in that diagnosis. But taking a step back, uh, focusing a little bit more on the symptoms or like asking a patient how they're feeling, I want to bring up a few points. One is that if you're asking a patient about falls, sleep, irritability, you might be able to identify somebody with these early stages of encephalopathy or these symptoms are in fact uh, nonspecific. But depending on your index of suspicion that it's a change in that person, you may be likely to attribute it to hepatic encephalopathy. So broadly, HE causes two different types of changes in patient reported outcomes. One, to the patient, and two, to the caregiver. And it's, not, it's important not to forget that that other person in the room with them, they, they, their life is being turned upside down by the revolving door of hospitalizations that is often caused by hepatic encephalopathy. There are standard forms that one can do to uh, demonstrate the presence of caregiver distress. But I think in practice, it's important just to say, hey, how are you doing? And focus a little bit on perhaps referring the caregiver for their own support. But in general, patients with encephalopathy will experience deficits in their, in their practice, in their work, uh, as well as they're more likely to present with uh, depression and uh, disability. Thank you, and I think that's such an important point about the caregiver because this is a condition that you know, is burdensome, but not just to the patient who's affected, to the person who has to care for them, to the healthcare system because they're so frequently admitted, and that's why it's important for us to understand it and know how to, to treat it effectively. Um, before we transition into treatment, um, just a question about, there are some apps that are available that could maybe detect some of this early stage minimal um, and stage one HE. Um, are, are either of you utilizing them? Do you find them to be helpful, um, practical in, in your practice? Yeah, so uh, what, what you're getting at is that there are these uh, tools that have been validated in experimental populations of uh, very clean cohorts of well-defined patients with cirrhosis. They're, they're not drinking alcohol, they're not on uh, medications that could be sedating, uh, but in general, your performance on some of these apps, which are getting at the time it takes for you to correctly complete some games, uh, the best one out there is called the Encephalab Stroop. And uh, essentially, this is a, a test that goes back many decades, uh, taken from the, uh, from the literature on ADHD, actually. Uh, I suggest that you download it and do it yourself before you ask a patient uh, <laughs> to do it. But um, we're doing it in research. And if you're interested in tracking uh, someone's um, uh, uh, cognition, and you've got a completely with it patient or someone who's got a highly uh, uh, technologically savvy caregiver, it's not an unreasonable test. I wouldn't use the cutoffs that are published in the literature to define who has minimal encephalopathy, but within a given person, you can see variance. And if someone's doing much worse than they were at baseline, that could be a sign that uh, they're getting behind on their treatment that you may need to change uh, something about their, their medical care. Th that's, that's my particular takeaway from uh, the literature on these tools. I agree, you know, minimal HE right now I think is very important. Uh, uh, these patient reported outcomes have been underemphasized in the past, fortunately with, with important researchers like Elliot that are making uh, this 
these issues much more clinically relevant, which they are, uh, and giving us data. Plus, from a regulatory standpoint, patient reported outcomes are becoming increasingly important now for approval of medications for many different uh, disease states. This is going to be more important, and I believe in the future, minimal HE will become even much more prominent in our care of patients with cirrhosis. And we will use things like these apps for diagnosis because they're easy and they have been validated. Uh, in the past, we've used pencil and paper tests, and there are some other computer-based testing that have been used, but they're a little more, uh, I'd say, difficult to administer and grade than some of these apps. So I think we will be using them more. More research will evolve. And when we have definitive therapies for patients with minimal HE to follow, it will become even more important. I tend to find that, you know, I like the use of apps as a way, as a way or a mechanism to try and engage patients in their care. And, and the same goes for their caregiver that's there with them. So more often than not, when I'm counseling a patient, I'm trying to find a way in which they're going to participate in their care. And I feel that utilization of these apps is one way that you can engage a patient who's not so participatory in their care, and you could also use it as a mechanism for those patients who really like to take control of their own care. Definitely. If I could add just sure. one thing. Yeah. You know, again, you know, uh, minimal encephalopathy, largely the domain of research, but very important. And if you're so inclined to treat it, and you think that, you, that something is going on with your patient that is potentially reversible, but you're looking for some concrete evidence, uh, a number that you can track, that app is useful. And if I could put a plug for one other test like mm -hmm. this, uh, it's, a, it's kind of fun, it's called the animal naming test, mm -hmm. okay? And, and you, it takes a minute to do, and you simply ask the patient and you count how many unique animals that they can name. And if they can rattle off dozens of animals, likelihood they do not have uh, minimal encephalopathy, but you can track the number of animals that your patient is uh, willing to disclose. Yeah, that's a great one and very easy to do. Yeah. doesn't require any technology, yeah. um, only 60 seconds.